Hi, I'm Nathan Cole, and today let's talk about how to phrase like a vocalist, like a singer. Start with a little Mozart, huh? The opening in the fifth concerto there, always a, always a, a wake-up call <laughs> after that long tutti. So I'm Nathan Cole. Today we're going to try actually a new way of looking at a piece of music. And by the end of this video, it's my hope that the next time you work on a piece, you'll have a framework, the system really, to organize the notes on the page so that you can phrase like a singer and with confidence. So phrasing. This word phrasing, most violinists, myself included, have or used to have a real inferiority complex about phrasing. You know, we, we look at singers and maybe we say, you know, we're, we're going to leave the phrasing to them <laughs> because they're singing, you know, actual phrases with words. And when it comes to violin music, we often throw up our hands and, and default to the, the old cliche, I just want to make a long line, you know, make the long line. It's kind of one of those meaningless sayings like, uh, let the weight of your arm give you your sound. You know how much your arm actually weighs? If I put the bow right here, it's falling right off. Anyway, the arm weight, uh, that's a saying for another video. For right now, make sure that you've downloaded the packet I've prepared for you. It has all the music that we're going to work with today. The link is below in the description. It's a set of three songs. Two of the songs have words, and the other one doesn't. First song you know very well. You've sung it a million times, I bet. And even better, it's newly in the public domain. I always like that. Second song you may know. I sang it growing up, but you probably didn't. The third song you know, but you've likely never sung it, at least not with your voice. So mysteries, what are these songs? Make sure you've downloaded that packet because as much fun as it is to listen to me talk, <laughs> and play. If you really want to transform the way you sing on the violin, uh, you've got to mark up your music with me. We're going to be doing it together. Get your hands around the songs. So go ahead and pause, get that packet, come right back. I'll still be here, I promise. So our first song, big reveal, happy birthday. We're going to use this song, perhaps the most famous song in the world, could be, to introduce our new approach because nobody learns this song from the page. I can't think of one person who has learned happy birthday from looking at the music. The point is you already know it, so you know where you want your performance, if we can imagine a performance of happy birthday. You know how you want to sing it. You know how you want the performance to end up. So what I want to do with happy birthday and eventually with all music is to work backward from there so that the printed page ends up reflecting the end result that we want, the performance. Now, why doesn't the page just start out doing that in the first place? You know, if we look at the music right now, why couldn't this page just tell us exactly how it should be played or sung? It couldn't possibly. You know, language, whether it's spoken or musical language, is just much too complex for that, for uh, marking down on the page. The human brain, the ear, the tongue, you know, all these things contain so many nuances that we take for granted. But the meaning is always contextual, so it can't be fully represented on paper. I'll give you an example, non-musical example, Shakespeare. Okay, so let's imagine the most famous speech or soliloquy in Shakespeare from Hamlet, to be or not to be. It's actually written in a, a meter, 
you know, a musical meter. They call it iambic pentameter. Did I say pentameter? Pentameter. Five beats, basically. To be or not to be, that is the question. But nobody says it that way. You know, just listen to the words if you haven't heard them in a while. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles. To be or not to be, that is the question. To actually say it that way would be ridiculous, right? You know, if you were listening, you'd, you'd say, this person knows the words, but not the music. And you can even see how one sentence spans three lines, or we might call them bars, if you look back at those words. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles. Okay, that's, that's three whole lines, three bars, but it's one sentence. So, here we go over to happy birthday. And uh, I know you're, you're already thinking I must be a ton of fun at birthday parties. Okay, everyone, before the cake comes out, let's rehearse. Um, no, but we can use this as an example because the phrasing is so clear to us already. Would you actually sing it with me? <laughs> Sorry, don't be shy. The only person uh, anyone can hear is me, unless you sing really loud. All right, let's go. You can uh, substitute your own name for Nathan. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Nathan. Happy birthday to you. And it's really a good thing that I make a living doing something else. We're going to start by marking what the phrases are in the music, okay? Phrases are either sentences or complete thoughts. Should be pretty obvious what they are. Let's turn to the music. Get my old marking pen ready. So, what are these main ideas? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Oh, here I've got dear loved one. All right, I didn't sing that. Happy birthday to you. Pretty obvious. Now, different people, different intelligent people might disagree about lengths. You know, is the phrase this long or that long? You know, for example, I might think, um, you know, it's a nice form to have two shorter phrases and a longer one. So, for example, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, and then all of the, eh, all of the rest, one phrase. Happy birthday to your loved one, happy birthday to you, short, short, long. But we'd really be arguing between choices that make sense. You know, nobody would say that happy is a phrase, or even happy birthday, that's the title of the song, but happy birthday, unless it's got an exclamation point at the end of it, that's not a complete thought. It's happy birthday to you. Okay, so now that we've got them marked, what do you notice about the phrases and the bar lines? Take another look at the lengths of the phrases and where those bar lines are. Right, the two don't go together. Not a single phrase on that page starts or ends on a bar line. Okay, the bar lines are there to organize time on the page, but they don't tell us how the music goes. Remember that. If it's the only thing you remember from today, I'll, leave, I'll bookmark it here in the video somehow. Now, is there any phrase more important than the others? And let's mark, let's mark it if so. How can we tell? It could be through the meaning of the text, right? It could be some sort of rhythmic clue, melodic clue. Let's uh, quickly examine the words and the syllables. Okay, let's see what we've got. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. I think this moment, yeah, happy birthday. Maybe I'll put a star. Oops. That's sort of a star. On that top note, it's the top note of the thing melodically. Um, so that's a good clue. And it's the third time we've said birthday. That magic number three it comes before a format. All those things are telling me that's the most important phrase and maybe the most important note there. All right, for words and syllables. Now, starting with phrases, those are sentences or complete thoughts. Syllables are basically notes, okay? So a word might be made of one syllable, or it could be made of more. 
And those syllables have a certain grammar to them, right? What syllable do you accent in a word? And how do you learn that? How do you learn grammar and pronunciation? It's through experience, right? And trial and error, starting when you're a little baby. So just as with language, I'm going to start from the first word and go from there. All right. When, uh, what I'd like to mark on the page are some diminuendos and crescendos to help us decide what the words are. One word is happy, right? Now nobody would say happy, right? Happy. So why don't I go ahead and mark that? It's a little, you could call it a long accent or a dim. Similarly, birthday. That's a two syllable word. Certainly not birthday. So birthday. Between happy and birthday, happy birth. Birthday. I might call that a little crescendo in between happy and birthday. Birthday to you. I'm going to say it's to you rather than to you. <laughs> so we'll have another one like that. And then you, I'm going to I'm going to let that taper, right? New phrase is starting. Same kind of markings, right? Sorry, so messy. Happy birthday, dear loved one. Loved one, for sure. It's going to get that kind of shape. Dear loved one. That'll go across. Birthday, we've got that. All the same stuff. You can see what we're about there. I'm going to leave the end for you to do. So we've got some, some dims and some crescendos in there. I tried to start with the things that were obvious to me and then to go on from there. The nice thing is I can always change my mind, whether it's uh, here on a tablet or a pencil and paper. Don't use pen, don't use marker. I can always change my mind later. And only now really am I ready for my instrument. And this part actually is musically the least interesting, though of course it's what we might call instrumental craft, mapping some bowings onto this, mapping some fingerings onto the, this paragraph that we've translated. Okay. How do you learn to do that? How do you learn to put bowings and fingerings on there? Again, experience, trial and error, just as you would with language. So whatever bowings I choose should reflect the song. And this one, not a lot of smooth transitions, right? Or vowel words, happy birthday to you. You know, you might be a vowel word. But are there any obvious slurs? Okay, I often like to start there. Any syllables that seem to want to go together in the bow, whether they're slurred or not. I'm having trouble coming up with any except for happy. Happy seems to want to hook to me. Or the direction doesn't matter so much. But that's how I'd like to put those together. Birthday is one word. So I could do that. I wouldn't say that it's an obvious one. The shape is the important thing rather than the slur. So say I'm going to hook happy. Other than that, I'll, I'll sort of improvise. After obvious slurs, I look to look for slides or glissandi. Okay. Are there any, any obvious places here where I want to slide? Uh, I wouldn't say so. Some, maybe at some parties you like to sing happy birthday, but that's, um, I'm not feeling that one. I'm not seeing any obvious slides in happy birthday. How about string changes, which is really voicing, you know, choosing a different sort of voice. This would be my normal speaking voice. Maybe it's a more sultry. I don't know if I can do sultry. Very direct. You know, that's, these are all string changes, right? Also not seeing a ton of that here. You know, maybe I'd like a different string for happy birth, a top note. That's easily done. All right. Good. Let's play what we've got. See how far that took us.
rather, rather grand happy birthday there. A little slower pace. So, question for you, and you can, you can take notes or you can just think about it. Were you surprised at how naturally you phrased happy birthday when you sang it? Because I know you did. I know you didn't sing it in a monotone or with every syllable being the same. No one does that. Let's move on to uh, our next song. And this one is Old Kentucky Home. I always thought it was my old Kentucky home, but apparently it's just Old Kentucky Home. As I flip the page here, well, maybe it is my old Kentucky home. The mystery continues. I had to sing this all the time as a kid um, growing up in Kentucky. And the funny thing was nobody knew any of the words except uh, when we'd get to sort of the chorus, weep no more, my ladies. And then <laughs> every, everybody in the hall or the auditorium or whatever would, it would suddenly get really loud, even though the rest of the song had been just uh, mumbling. But it is a beautiful song from a great songwriter, Stephen Foster. Let's uh, actually start by looking at the text for general meaning and feeling. Okay, what have we got here? The sun shines bright in the old Kentucky home. Tis summer, the old folks are gay. The corn tops ripe in the meadows in the bloom while the birds make music all the day. Young folks roll on the... Okay, uh, every, everything is great. But by and by, hard times comes a knocking at the door. Hard times is supposed to be like a character, the embodiment of hard times. Comes a knocking at the door, then my old Kentucky home, good night. Weep no more, my lady. Oh, not ladies. Oh, weep no more today. We will sing one song for the old Kentucky home, old Kentucky home far away. So there's a, a sense of nostalgia, right? If this were a painting, we could imagine some golden hues, right? It's not noonday light. It's maybe late afternoon, the golden hour. Let's mark phrases like we did before. Sun shines bright in the old Kentucky home. Well, that's not going to work. I've got to get my red pencil going. Sun shines bright in the old Kentucky home. Tis summer, the old folks are gay. Corn tops ripen those in bloom while the birds make music all the day. So again, we could have done short, short, long. We could have combined these two the corn tops ripe in the meadows in the bloom while the birds make music all the day. Maybe that's one long one. Folks roll on the little cabin floor, all merry, all happy and bright. And by hard times comes a knocking at the door. My old Kentucky home, good night. So we, right. Are all the phrases the same length, like I'm marking them here, or are some longer than others? Intelligent people could disagree. Weep no more, my lady. Oh, weep no more today. I'm going to say that's two different ones because we've got that rest in there. This is a longer one. We, oh, no. We will sing one song for the old Kentucky home, for the old Kentucky home far away. All right. Again, we could disagree about whether we've got short ones, long ones, but those are clearly phrases. Again, notice how seldom the bar lines match up with the phrases, right? If you take another look at that, we've got the same thing as in Happy Birthday. Almost no phrases uh, start or end on a bar line. Our, our exception is the <laughs> weep no more, my lady. That might be the only one that I see. But just because phrases don't start or end on a bar line doesn't mean that you can't have an emphasis on the bar line. But the emphasis doesn't mean an end or a beginning. So that's important for us to, to watch for, to listen for. Are there any phrases more or less important than others? Let's again take a look. Um, we've got some atmosphere, some mood setting in the beginning. Um, we've got a change in character, don't we, here? We've <laughs> gone from happy and bright to by and by hard times comes a knocking at the door. And that even has a fermata at the end of it. So that seems... I'm starring that because that seems to be more important. Weep no more, my lady. That starts right on a bar line. I'm going to say that that also gets some special love. A weep no more today. Sing one song for the old Kentucky home. That is another fermata, so that's a clue, and it also goes up to near the top of the register. Um, 
Sure, let's store that one too. And then we'll say that we'll dwindle at the end. <clears throat> now, next step, after we've marked phrases and, and maybe highlighted a few phrases that are more important than others, we mark some words, some relationships. Okay, this is a longer song. I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but let's at least start the process. Sun shines bright in the old Kentucky home. So Kentucky, right, that's a word, but it spans three syllables. Kentucky is how we would pronounce it. We can decide, we would maybe change our mind later if we want it to be Kentucky, <laughs> since that's how the melody goes, but we've got Kentucky. Sun shines bright. The sun, all right, the sun shines bright in the old Kentucky home. In fact, I'm going to extend that dim Kentucky home so that those go together to summer. There we go. The old folks, we're not going to say old folks. The old folks are gay. There we go. Let's just take another couple examples. I won't do all the words. While the birds. I'm going to say that while is stronger than the. While the birds make music all the day. And then all of these longer notes, with, with few exceptions, I'm going to let them taper, right? So I'm going to go... Before I really try to play this, I would go and, and mark all these words, these relationships between the syllables. Now, these are longer phrases than in happy birthday, right? Happy birthday were only a few beats long, but they're still made up of words that have those syllable relationships. So the same process. Now, sometimes when teachers, including me, I'm guilty, say, you know, long line or long phrase, we, we think we need to smooth everything out. But if you listen to Heifetz and other players of his era, you know, hardly two bows go by with the same sound, right? And that's because he's thinking vocally. Those are syllables. And, you know, for an ex amazing example of this, listen to his recording of another song by the same songwriter. Um, that song is called Genie with the Light Brown Hair. Uh, we won't share the Heifetz recording, the sound recordings are copyrighted, but listen to it. Uh, you'll, you'll get goosebumps for sure. It, it starts, um, it's I Dream of Genie with a Light Brown Hair, you know. And then just listen to Heifetz. Um, let's go back to Kentucky Home. Once again, we can disagree on the phrase lengths, but as long as our choices make sense, we're, we're going to be on a good path. Um, I mentioned if you want it, you've got the short, short, long structure. Now, when we talk about the words, the syllables, those smaller shapes raise some interesting questions. And that's where the real fun comes in for me. You know, how do we want to end these phrases, for example? Um, we've got different choices, up or down. Um, going back to the music... For example, this uh, by and by hard times comes a knocking at the door. You know, normally we would say knocking at the door and let it taper. But perhaps we feel that this is a more dramatic thing that should grow and join than my old. I don't really feel it there, actually. I'm going to put that back. How about here with lady? I mentioned that I marked those as two phrases. Weep no more, my lady. Oh, weep no more today. What if uh, we decide instead, we actually do want that to be one longer phrase, since it's a comma, not a period. Weep no more, my lady. Oh, weep no more today. So in that case, I'm going to take away that little 
dim. I'm going to have that pretend like it's growing through the rest. One of those where you take a breath, you know, you've got something so important to say, you run out of air and then you take a quick breath and you keep going. So that's how, you know, a speaker might crescendo through a rest. Oh, weep. No more today. All right. So this other fermata down here, perhaps that's one that we might do a dramatic dim there to end that little phrase and to transition us into a different sound. I'm giving something away there by marking a Roman numeral four, <laughs> but we'll get to that. Turning our attention to instrumental questions now. Slurs, right? We talked about slurs and hooks and happy birthday. What does that look like here? Um, are there words that really need to be slurred? Old Kentucky. See, those are two words. And so we'll talk about how the, the slurring and the hooking don't always go by the beat. You know, once again, I'm not seeing so many obvious slurs in this and potentially not too many obvious hooks. It's not really that kind of song. It's a lot of consonants again. How about slides? Um, we're not going to sing the whole song, but you could to give you some ideas of slides. Um, I'm not seeing a whole lot of big ones. It's pretty stepwise. This song makes it a little bit easier for amateurs to sing, right? And that was the idea. Um, wasn't my old Vienna home where everybody knows how to sing opera or something. <laughs> but maybe we'll slide a couple slides in there. String changes, voice changes. Now, surely there are some of those um, because we've got the tune, or at least in <laughs> my little arrangement here, we've got the tune in two different octaves, right? So, but then we've got it next. So, uh, naturally we'd want that on a different string, not only because it's easier, you know, we probably wouldn't want to play that on the D anyway, but that might imply a slightly different uh, sound, right? Less concentration of the bow, perhaps. Um, and maybe we want to keep uh, that line on the A string if we're starting there. Maybe we save our E string sound for weep no more my ladies. My lady, I keep saying ladies. E string and then A string. And surely that last hushed phrase best on the G string. I already marked it and gave it away, but... An airier bow. It's only at this point that I would actually concern myself with bow directions and finger numbers. You know, we haven't done any of that yet, and that's for a reason. Because in the end, there are just so many possibilities for those things. But as long as you have the tools to do all of them, One's kind of as good as the other. What I mean is, if you can make a shape hooking and playing down bow, you should be able to make the same shape hooking and up bow, or separate, right? Or even three ups. It may be easier or more difficult to do it in different bowing styles, but as long as you know the shape you want, the actual bow directions, not so important. Same with fingered numbers. The important things are the slides, the string changes. All right, so what are these tools that you need in order to accomplish anything you might want to phrasing-wise? In the right hand, it's the ability to connect bows in any part of the bow, right? But also here, shouldn't matter what part of the bow you're in to connect them. The ability to play different strokes, in other words, articulations, 
consonants and vowels of different strengths. Mm -hmm. The ability to grow or to diminish in a single bow or over several, right? The sun shines bright. The young folks roll, right? To diminish over three bows or in a single bow, maybe to diminish and grow in the same bow. The awareness of the different strings and voices, if you want to call them that, and how to transition from one to another. In the left hand, whoop, that's my right. In the left hand, you need fingers that allow you to speak or sing in a rhythm that gives meaning to the song, right? So if I want to sing Old Kentucky Home, then my fingers have to be fast and coordinated enough to do synced up with the bow. That's not so fast. I would hope I could do that. But nevertheless, the last thing I want is for my bow to have to wait for fingers that are not playing in the musical rhythm, which could be slightly different from the rhythm that's on the page. The ability to play in tune without compromising that, that rhythm or that meaning. Intonation is so much a part of the sound quality, remember. The ability to connect notes with glissandi of different types and speeds, should that be necessary. Well, necessary, desirable. So now that I've set myself up with all those impossible expectations, let's play. Got the song in our ear. So hopefully the, the playing and the, the work that we do will be working backwards from that song and that phrasing we've already got in our ear. All right. Old Kentucky home it is. Interesting, as I play that, to notice how often the dotted eighth, sixteenth rhythm should not be grouped as it looks, right? Just the, the best example is right there in that second full bar, Old Kentucky Home, right? It's not Old Kentucky Home, it's Old Kentucky. So the phrase or the syllables, right, they don't only go over the bar lines, they go over the beats or the beams. So even the beaming you can look at as a convenience rather than telling you how the music should go. So another question for you. Have you ever started your work on a piece by examining the grammar rather than just starting with finger numbers and bowings? We'll go now to a song without words. This is uh, by Mendelssohn. Now, Mendelssohn has a piece called Song Without Words. Um, this, however, is <laughs> the opening of his violin concerto, 
which is also a song without words. Now, we've got no text for meaning, right? We can't read about a birthday party. We can't read about young folks rolling in the hay or the grass or whatever it is and people knocking at the door. All we've got is this uh, manuscript. And we may have to fight against the sound, the phrasing baggage that we already have, right? Because we will have heard this piece a lot. We may have played it, worked on it a lot. But let's take this fresh approach and reinvent the piece for ourselves. So we've got no text, but we do have a few phrase indications from the composer. Now these are bowings or phrase markings in the manuscript. That's what I've given you in, in the packet. Those are the bowings that are in the manuscript. <laughs> on this topic, I can't resist. If you haven't seen a video, it's on YouTube somewhere, of uh, Pincus Zuckerman and Nathan Milstein a young Zuckerman is playing for an older Milstein and uh, trying to convince him basically that the Boeing that's in the manuscript uh, is the right one. And he says, well, Mendelssohn, you know, had really good advisors. He had great help. He worked with Ferdinand David, who knew a lot about Boeings. And Milstein keeps trying to get a word in and at one point where uh, Zuckerman mentions Ferdinand David again and how much he, he knew about Boeing's, Milstein stops him and says, but not as much as me. So it's a great video and uh, two, two violin greats right there head to head. Now, in this Mendelssohn, it's clear why some Boeing changes have become tradition, you know, including from great players like Nathan Milstein and Pinker Zuckerman. In other places, though, it's not as clear why some traditions got handed down. It seems like they got handed down without great musical reasons. So let's take a look here and uh, mark the obvious phrases that we can find. This is a, a long one, right? It comes to a nice point of rest. We could... Again, we could disagree and say, oh, that this one's actually made up of two smaller ones, or, or maybe it's longer than we're saying. But as a starting point, we can go there. Should we take it all the way to there? All right. And maybe. Here's an interesting thing. We're on that sforzando there. That's an ending and a beginning. Okay, well, we've marked some obvious things again. And if you look at it, once again, the phrases and the bar lines, they're hardly ever, if ever, going together. It's such a common thing in, in vocal or vocal style music, which Mendelssohn certainly knew how to write. And if you look there at measure 28, that place that's both an ending and a beginning. So it's up to us to interpret how we're going to, to perform that. Now, any phrases that are more or less important, if we go back to here, um, we can judge by the, the contour of the lines, maybe, you know, which go up higher. Obviously, here in bar 24 is a big high point. There's a crescendo that's pointing the way there. Interesting that the crescendo goes a little bit beyond there, however. And then there's that sforzando later. So um, it is a long idea, right? Maybe we'll say that that sforzando is actually the very top with this other starred um, moment, a nice checkpoint along the way. So it's, it's a long idea with no rests, but it's still made up of phrases, and those phrases are made up of words and syllables. So let's mark a bit of that. Now, just like so many other words that we've marked, I'm going to take that first syllable to be the stronger one, but it's going to lead here. The F sharp decorating the E. 
Now I'm going to make a judgment call here and say that we're going to relax into that bar line, not only because it goes down in pitch, but just because it makes it a little bit less square. Leading up to the E there. Should we do the same to the D sharp? Maybe we can do the opposite and so forth. We're looking for pairs of notes or groups of notes that might form words. Now, we have to go with, with our gut on that. Again, we can always change our mind later, but when you have good taste, which you can develop over time and with experience, you can start with the obvious things and to go from there. Again, intelligent people could disagree about some things, but not others. <laughs> We're not going to say that, that that's a phrase or a complete thought, right? Um, certainly not. That's not a complete thought. All right. So when we're going to put this together, the challenge is to hear not what we want to hear or not just what we've marked on the page, but what's actually coming out. Okay. Once we've gone through this process on the whole page, we've got the music in our inner ear. So we've got to figure out where does our playing match that and where does it not? Okay. In other words, we're using that printed page just as a way to take notes, the notes we're writing. All right. And then by the end, we're going to have our performance match our new printed page. All right, let's play a little bit of this, a little bit under tempo so that I can get the syllables the way I have them on the page. quicker. Now I'm noticing a couple things. Number one, I'm trying to relax into that last downbeat. And it's a little bit of a delicate bow change down there. Kind of wishing that were in the upper half. The other thing I'm noticing is that I'm having to make a big crescendo there, a bigger one than I'd like, just because I've got some bow to recover. Now, what might solve both of these problems? A nice bowing tradition that's been handed down to us, and that's to hook, right? And now, that ends up at the tip and I didn't have to use quite as much bow on that E. And that just has so much more going for it, so much more interest than if I just said, I'm going to play the long line. And that might sound nice enough, right? It's nice enough, but it lacks a, a message for me, right? I don't want to be afraid to articulate as if those were separate words or syllables. And maybe I put a little bit more of a break. Before restarting. All these are decisions I can make independent of bow directions and certainly finger numbers. We didn't even get into slides in this one or string changes that I can leave for you to have fun on your own. So prompt for you. Did you find it 
any more difficult to understand the grammar of a song like this without words. Because let's face it, most of the music we're going to play is going to look more like this, no words. But now that you've done this and gone through it with songs you know, songs that do have words, I hope that you'll consider learning your next piece, working from the end, working from that performance that you have in your ear based on your understanding of the musical grammar, and then marking up the printed page eventually to reflect that great reality, the one that you already have in your head. So thanks for joining me for this. I'm Nathan Cole. Look forward to seeing you next time.